Hello, we are Team KEMX, consisting of K, Estelle, Miru, and Singhui. I am K, and I am part of the hardware team, the main builder, and the meeting coordinator. I arrange and keep track of meetings and work with the team leader to set goals. I am Estelle, and I am the photographer. Part of my role is to take pictures and videos of our robot to document its progress. I am also part of the software development team and, and am the main coder. I am Miru and I am the team leader and I'm part of the hardware team. As the leader, my role is to delegate various tasks and set goals for each team member to complete. I also ensure that our team is consistently progressing and that everyone has a fair share of work to complete. Based on the circumstances, I am able to complete a multitude of tasks. I'm Singhui and I'm a secretary. My role is to consistently keep track of our hardware and software progress in an organized manner. I work together with the photographer to store visual documentation and specific details of all our competition progress over the span of 1.5 months. I'm also part of the software development team. These are some photos of our finished robot. Since we had no previous competition experience, we decided to use mostly Lego Mindstorm's EV3 motors, sensors, and parts for two main reasons. Firstly, there's existing software documentation so that the learning curve for us is less steep. Also, the Lego parts can be easily modified and rebuilt, allowing us for, to make quick innovations and changes. However, some parts other than the commercial Lego kit include the time of flight sensor, high technique color sensor, string, sponge, and cardboard ramp. Firstly, we will go further in depth into the different aspects of our hardware. This is a video of our working claw. It closes on an item and lifts it and places it into our sorter. We have five main considerations when developing the claw. First, we wanted the claw to be able to grip the balls and rescue kit reliably, such that they do not roll or fall out during pickup. We decided to use interlocking Lego J-beams that, when in its close position, grips all the required items tightly, while also having a long reach to improve our chances of picking up the items. We also added some flexible Lego rubber pieces at the bottom of the claw and sponges along the side of the claw to be able to adapt to the different shapes of the items and improve grip. Second, the weight of the claw. When we first made the claw, it had three beams on the right side and two beams on the left. However, as seen in this video, the claw will stall when it got heavier. Therefore, we lightened the claw to have two beams on both sides. Third, we had to design the claw to be at least 1.5 cm above the ground so that it would not get caught on speed bumps. Due to the balls and the rescue kit being relatively small, we had to make sure that the claw was as low as possible. And we also had to use an axle with an end stop to avoid using stoppers at the bo bottom of the claw. For since the EV3 brain only has four mo motor ports and two are used for wheels and one is used for sorting and depositing, we had to minimize the number of motors used for the claw. And both closing and pickup functions of the claw use the same motor through this gear system. When the claw can no longer close, it will instead lift up. Fifth, we did not want to have the robot sweep left and right to look for balls and rescue kit as it may compromise our line tracking. Thus, we made the claw as wide as possible so it's able to funnel the item into the middle of the claw for the front, sen front sensor to detect. Next, we will explain our driving system. We opted to use tracks instead of two-wheel or four-wheel drive as it had a greater surface area of contact with the ground and thus provided more traction. This helps us overcome speed bumps and ramps. We chose to use large LEGO EV3 motors instead of the medium one as the large one has more torque to overcome speed bumps and ramps. Moving on to our sorting mechanism. The video shows our sorting mechanism that is able to sort live victims, dead victims and the rescue kit. After the items are sorted, they will slide down the ramp and into the basket so that they are ready to be deposited. The image shows how the basket should look like upon the successful pickup of all items. Next, this is our depositing mechanism. The Lego backing is connected to the sorter via a string, and as the sorter turns 360 degrees, the backing lifts up and allows items to fall out. Due to the length of the backing, the live victims are able to fall before the dead victims. As the sorter turns in and in the opposite direction, the string slacks and the backing falls back down to allow the robot to store and deposit items again if necessary. Since we can only use a maximum of four motors, we had to come up with a way to use a single motor to perform both functions. And we were able to come up with an innovative solution that is now known as our string mechanism. Next slide. By connecting the string to our ball sorter 
and Lego backing, we were able to perform both sorting and depositing by changing the extent to which the sorting basket turns, as shown in the diagram. Next, moving on to the sensors. We have four sensors connected to the robot. First, there's the time of flight sensor that identifies the distance between the robot and objects in front of it and helps with obstacle avoidance, evacuation zone navigation, and evacuation point detection. It is placed less than 6 cm above the ground so that it can identify a level 2 evacuation point. We will explain more about how this works later on. We also have two light sensors facing downwards. These are used for line tracking. Between them is a high technique color sensor facing forward that is used for the identification of obstacles, victims, and the rescue kit. Next, our line tracking structure. There are two light sensors that are placed such that they are on either side of the black line that is followed for line tracking. Thus, when the robot goes, goes off course, it can correct itself based on the input of both sensors. These sensors are also placed such that they will be in the middle of green squares at junctions and can easily identify them. They are positioned roughly 1 cm above the ground in order to avoid getting caught on speed bumps. We placed a zip tie around the sensors to ensure that they do not move out of position during a run. One more feature of the robot that contributes to line tracking is that its center of gravity is positioned near its line tracking structure. We put as few elements as possible to the back of the robot and made them all light so that we can ensure that the center of gravity is closer to the front of the robot. Thus, when the robot turns, it is able to be more precise and contributes to the reliability of our run. Lastly, there have been various instances where we optimized our hardware. Firstly, from having no sorting mechanism, we combined sorting and depositing to use only one motor. Secondly, we also changed our depositing mechanism from a one-time depositing removable plastic backing to a multiple-time depositing Lego backing so that whenever the robot encountered the evacuation point in the evacuation zone, it could deposit whatever it was carrying, ensuring reliability and also making sure that we would there would be no loose parts hanging from the robot. Thirdly, we change our claw from a 1 cm to 1.5 cm height, which prevents the claw from getting stuck on consecutive speed bumps. Fourthly, we install axles at the back of the claw to prevent it from moving beyond a certain point, thus the claw will always start from the same position and makes pickup more reliable. Now, we will talk about the software and the different strategies we implemented. Okay, firstly, the robot line tracks using proportional control. The idea with proportional control is that the further away it is from an ideal state or the greater the error, the more aggressively it needs to react to get back on track. Our robot defines the error as the difference between the right and left sensor's green values and uses it to determine what speed and angle it should move at to steer itself onto the line. As can be seen in the diagram below, if the error is negative, it should go left, and if the error is positive, it should go right. From the second diagram, we can see that the greater the magnitude of the error, the greater the magnitude of the angle it should turn. And since the robot has to make a sharper turn, the speed also decreases. We made the speed decrease proportionally when the magnitude of the error increased by having it be equal to 1 minus the absolute value of the error multiplied by a constant, and the angle varies proportionally with the error as it is equal to the error multiplied by a constant. The ideal values of these two constants were determined through trial and error. Okay, the robot also has to identify various colors on the map. We used calibrated values so that the values from the right and left sensors can be compared consistently even if they have different raw values. The colors are identified by checking the distance between the color sensed and the ideal value of the color it's checking for. This distance is calculated using the formula shown. Also, the robot has to stop on the end tile, so when it senses the red line, it will move forward 5 cm and stop. Next, there's green square detection. The robot only checks for green squares after both light sensors sense a black line. The rationale behind this is that after any green squares that the robot is supposed to identify, there will be a point when the light sensors will sense two black lines, as can be seen in the diagram on the right. So only after sensing double black is the robot prompted to move back to look for green squares. This prevents two potential mishaps. 
One, it reduces the likelihood of the robot falsely identifying green squares at any other point on the map, as it is doing fewer checks for green squares. And two, it prevents the robot from taking instructions from any green squares placed after the black line that is meant to ignore. After executing this double black code, the robot will ignore all instances of double black for the next 10 cm of line tracking. This will prevent it from identifying the same double black area again as it continues line tracking. Now we will talk about the main users of the front sensor, that being the identification of the rescue kit and the obstacle. The front sensor is constantly looking for objects in front of it. When it senses one, it checks whether it is blue. If it is blue, it executes the code for the rescue kit. And if it isn't blue, it executes code for the obstacle avoidance. First, we will talk about the code for the rescue kit. When it detects the rescue kit, the robot moves forward to ensure the rescue kit is as close as possible to the claw. Then, it will move back by 3cm to get the optimal position of the claw with reference to the cube. The cube will then be picked up and deposited into either section of the basket. The robot will then reverse its earlier movement, bringing it back onto its path, and then it will continue to line track. When it detects an obstacle, the robot will turn left so that its time of flight sensor faces the obstacle. It will start using the time of flight sensor to measure its distance from the obstacle and maintain that distance around the object as it slowly moves forward. This helps it get past both flat and circular obstacle surfaces. As it moves around the obstacle, the right sensor is checking for black to regain the line. Once black is detected by the sensor, the robot will move forward and, and then turn until the left sensor senses black to reposition itself on the line and then resume line tracking. Next, we'll talk about how the robot navigates the evacuation zone. When both the left and right sensors detect silver, the loop for line tracking code is broken and the robot enters a new loop to navigate the evacuation zone. The TOF sensor senses the robot's distance to a side wall, and the robot travels along the walls of the evacuation zone by maintaining this distance. At the corners, the robot will check for the evacuation point. Once it finishes the depositing, the robot finds the exit by wall tracking until the TOF sensor finds a gap in the wall. It then turns and moves forward to check if the tape is green or silver. If it is silver, it will reverse the motions and continue wall tracking. If it is green, it will break the evacuation point instead of look for line tracking. To check for the evacuation point, the robot will stop 30 cm away from the wall, turn 45 degrees anti-clockwise and move forward. If the TOF sensor detects object is less than 12 cm away, this means that the evacuation point is at this corner. The robot will turn until the back of the basket is facing the evacuation point. The robot will then move backwards and deposit the rescue kit into the evacuation point. It then carries out a reverse maneuver to align with the wall and continue spiraling. If the TOF sensor did not sense object less than 12 cm away, it will move backwards to its original position, turn 45 degrees clockwise before moving forward by 30 cm and 20 90 degrees anti clockwise. It then continues spiraling and repeats this process for the other corners until it detects the evacuation point. So, other than hardware, we also optimized our software to resolve the problems we had faced. For the first problem, there were times when the robot's left or right sensors would not perfectly add up on the green squares after moving back from double black. Our solution was to let the robot sweep left and right after moving back, so it, so it can still sense green squares when the initial position of the sensors are slightly off. The second problem was that the motors were sometimes not generating enough torque to execute their functions, such as lifting the claw or the backing, which would lead to the robot being permanently stopped. Our solution was to use runtime instead of run angle so that if this happens, the robot will not be permanently stopped and can continue with the rest of its functions. So there are some reflections and improvements. First, we all think that this was a great learning opportunity for us as we were all new to robotics with little to no experience. And this competition allowed us to dive straight into the field of robotics. Secondly, it... Uh... It was also a very fun experience as we spent many long hours preparing together. We had numerous fun moments, such as when the robot works. An area for improvement is that we could have had better strategizing. We could have spent more time analyzing how the scoring of the two different maps work so that we can secure more points and have a more solid plan on filming our maps. This is the link to some images of our robot. Last but not least, we would like to thank our coach, CCA mates, teachers, friends, and everyone who has guided and supported us every step of the way in the past 1.5 years.
nine months. With that, thank you for listening to our sharing.